there folks and welcome or welcome back to Nippon Trading International's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host Ziv Nakajima again and this podcast is brought to you among others by Emil Gorgis of realestate.jp. He's a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families who are looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian, he's been living here in Japan for over two decades now, and for about half of that time he's been buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in Tokyo on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So he's got dedicated loan officers in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts Panel Sessions which means that you're already aware of the fact that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area, and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, Drop him a line on sales at realestate.jp. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so for today's episode, I'm trying something new. These are two back-to-back conversations on a similar topic or at least a similar client profile. In this particular case, U.S. military service personnel living in Japan who are looking into purchasing homes near their bases for various purposes. So the first conversation is with a lady serving at Sasebo down here in Kyushu, where we're located as well. She and her spouse are looking for a family home with some very specific criteria related to the size, layout, and location within the city, but also on a budget. So we review one potential property together, then we expand the conversation a bit further to discuss general due diligence, structural inspections for these older wooden homes. We talk a bit about how we can help both via full facilitation or consulting, um, about how a Japanese spouse can or cannot assist in the process, which properties to avoid, and the National Realtor Property Database, RAINS, what is that all about, and much more. So I hope you find some value in it. And don't forget, there's another conversation coming right at the end of this one, so don't touch that dial. Okay, cool. So I've scrolled down through your email, um, and you've already got a property in mind from memory, right? Or I do, um, for now. Yep. Did you send me a link to that one? Or no, not yet, no, right? No, I didn't. Yep. I can do it right now. Yeah, if you'd like us to look at it while we're talking, yeah. Okay. I put it in the chat. Okay, let me bring that up. Is that a um I'm not a big expert, but is that a southern accent you've got there? Have I got that right? I don't know. Everybody got tell me I have a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, and then I went to the states um, when I was around eighteen, nineteen years old. Yeah. So watching movies, I guess I pick up a lot of different accents. <laughs> it's a very cool accent, though. Okay, so six million yen, four hundred and fifty-seven square land. Wow, that's nice in Japan and built 1980 okay so first thing i would say is just bear in mind that with properties um with the wooden properties at least that are over let's say 25 30 years old you're probably looking at an average of somewhere between three to four thousand bucks a year in maintenance and you'll have like five ten years where everything's okay but then the roof goes or you need termite protection again or whatever the case may be so on average um maybe two to three thousand from 25 30 years old and then as it approaches 40 years old like this one um probably more like three four um and also again because it's a wooden structure maybe just before you actually sign the contract and pay the deposit maybe organize a structural inspection just to make sure that there's nothing major that might occur like right after purchase or what the land is big enough um, the land is big enough that i'm assuming you're not going to have an issue with rebuilding so if at any point in the future um 
you want to tear the house down or some major damage occurs, let's say an earthquake or what, then you should be able to rebuild on the same land plot. That shouldn't be an issue, um, I think, but it's something that we'll you know, check with the agent and the seller during due diligence. And otherwise, let me just have a peek at the interior photos. Okay, so it's old, but reasonably good shape, at least from the looks of it. Uh, I see the storage room or former hen coop, maybe. Uh, it looks like it has a like a garage type of uh, storage. Yep. Um, there's some. But it's it didn't show in the pic. Sorry, go ahead. But the garage storage didn't show in the picture. It did show some sort of uh, storage, but I feel like that was like a little shed behind the carport. I think that's what it is. I think the garage that they're referring to is maybe the carport itself. Could be. I'm not sure. Um, and there's also, if you look at photo, do they have numbers? No, they don't have numbers, do they? Um, can I share my screen for a sec? Yes. So this one, can you see that? No, it's not showing it. Okay, it's showing now. Yep, okay. So see here that, I, I'm not sure what that is, but it could be a water leak that might have occurred in the past, something to maybe look at. So I think you're absolutely right because the hmm. listing does say it has termite and water leak damages. Water leak damages is not a, I mean, it could be a huge thing if you have to replace the roof, but at least we know how much it's going to cost overall to fix. Termite damage is a lot more scary for me because that could mean that the um, the foundation or the uh, some of the supporting walls are in bad shape, which is basically a rebuild, right? Mm. So that's maybe something to think about. Have you communicated with the agent or the seller at all? Are they foreigner friendly? Did no. You, no? So we have not, um, my wife actually knows uh, the, the son or the partner of the realtor company. Okay. Not very friendly people. Yeah. Uh, I heard that uh, <laughs> that 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 whole um, part of the city actually really, you know, not hate, but they really blacklisted that realtor. Okay. Okay. That's... Um... Not good news. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, well, I mean, if they're the listing, if they're the listing realtor and they are the ones appointed by the seller to list and sell the property, there's not much that we'll be able to do except work with them, or at least try to. Right. They're um, not. So, is it? Um, is the agency in Yokosuka or is it in Tokyo? No, it it is in uh, in. Uh, Sasebo City. Uh, Sasebo, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm thinking another army base, sorry. Sasebo City. So they, they must be used to working with foreigners, I'd say. I don't think so. That no? part of town in Kawatana is, uh, it is very, uh, how do I say it? No, they don't, they don't have a lot of foreigners. They don't quite friendly with foreigners. Okay, our, our property We're manager just... here in the office who's from Nagasaki is nodding her head to say that, yes, they're not yeah. used to working with foreigners. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, did um, I think we exchanged a few emails. Uh, you exchanged a few emails with Natalia. So you've got a rough idea of how we work and how everything, like we can represent you, sign everything on your behalf, do the whole transaction in Japanese so that they'll be satisfied with um, not having to speak to scary foreigners. And then you don't actually mm -hmm. have to travel for meetings or signings or anything of that sort. Um, and did you also um, did you also read about how we charge and how our fees are structured and all of that? Yes. Yeah, so um, still kind of torn in between um, the two types of uh, service you, you you can provide. I mean, with with my wife being Japanese. Um, eat, we can actually get her involved. Is she okay with that though? Because a lot of Japanese spouses are like, no, this is your thing. Oh, that is that is her actually. So. Okay. 
but also budget is um, pretty tight if yeah. we want to get a good property. So with a five percent, we can we can um, probably squeeze it in there. However, just a decision we have to make. Um, okay, but it's not it's not just the five percent. There's a bunch of purchase costs involved, right? Mm -hmm. So there's legal registration. The realtor are collecting their own fee. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a purchase tax statement, although that comes after settlement, like somewhere between six months to two years. There's also a purchase tax, um, which is another two and a half percent or so. So all up, worst case, hopefully it'll be a lot less, but hope, worst case, maybe factor in about 20 percent on top of the purchase price. Right. If you're using us and worst okay. case, let's say 15 percent if you're not using us. OK. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely discuss that. But the um, the more again the more significant factor here from again from my perspective as your representative I would say definitely factor in the uh, one thousand or two thousand bucks whatever the case may be for the structural inspection um, mm -hmm. because and and even if they say that you know they can't see any major signs of termite damage just keep in the back of your mind that maybe five ten years down the track you will have to do some you, you might suddenly discover something that was concealed which was actually damaged by those termites and might require a rebuild so did you have any other potential properties or was this like the one <laughs> um before we get into that i'm sorry you say the structural inspection how much um, is it estimately gonna be? It depends on the size. Technology? Yeah, so it depends on the size and layout of the house and how many components you include. With a house in this uh, age and this condition, we probably want to include all components to you know try them to uh, try to get them to have a look at the roof, the the structure, the base, um, and everything else. So somewhere between a thousand to two thousand dollars, usually the lower side of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so talking about prospect property, we have been looking, uh, quite actively the last uh, four months. Um, the issue that we've been having of not really making a decision is because of the budget. So right now I know for sure, um, asking for a mortgage loan here locally with the bank is impossible. Yeah. So my budget mainly come from my own saving and from my family so um with the with this budget me and the wife actually in agreeing that we're gonna probably find a crappy crappy one and it's gonna be like a long longer process to fix it up yeah but i mean there's crappy interior and you know windows that need to be replaced and stuff that's you know very contained within a typical renovation and there's stuff that just can't be repaired without a rebuild that's that's the stuff mm -hmm. i'm more concerned about so if you're the diy types mm -hmm. and you want to buy a place that you know very old school and needs some flooring and wallpapers and you need to redo some stuff that's one thing but if you have to completely demolish and rebuild the house and the minimum price to rebuild the house is like two three hundred thousand bucks so that's yeah. that's not a good idea right right yeah so uh, right now, I I cannot find any houses in my budget. Okay. Um, is either not in the side of the town that I want to be in, like adding probably an extra twenty five minutes of um, driving time from work to home just one way alone. That's pretty tough. Yeah. Um, and did you consider it all apartments or is that totally off the table? That will be off the table because um, I myself, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to plan for retirement also, yeah. which I, I want to happen in the next 10 years, you know, talking, retiring from, from the Navy because that's what, what, what I work for. Yep. Um, so if I do retire and keep my, my uh, side business as in doing woodworking have cool. you know having it in yeah having it in the apartment is definitely not, a, not yeah a no no <laughs> okay um okay so i mean look one option is to look at this one although to be honest if it let's say if it was me buying the property once i read termite damage i wouldn't even worry about a structural inspection like that'll be 
a very, very red flag for me because we, I mean, when they do a structural inspection, what they usually tell us in the report is that we've beware, we've found signs of termite damage. And here we already know that in advance. So there's not much else they'll be able to tell us, except again, there's a good chance that something structural is going to be in bad shape, right? Um, I would maybe... Um, and again, it's up to you on how you want to hire us. We can try to do this by the hour or two if you want, but to a certain point. Otherwise, it's not going to be very cost effective mm -hmm. for you. But okay. we can try to research other properties, get in touch with local agents. Um, within your criteria, which you'll send us by email, we can specify um, the maximum budget and try to find maybe slightly more suitable properties. Um, so I'd be more comfortable doing that than really digging into and spending money on, on re, um, inspecting this one. Um, and then maybe mm. if indeed we can't find anything whatsoever within, you know, a few weeks or a few months, then maybe go back to this one. I don't think it'll go anywhere. Sure. Mm. I think um, that's, um, that's what I want as well. Reaching out to you guys, um, yeah. knowing that you, you have... Um, you know, associated with um, um, the other guy, I'm sorry, who, um, I'm, I'm, I don't remember his name from the podcast, but he, he, he based in Tokyo, help with uh, finding family homes. Emil, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know, I know he can see uh, that, that website with all the realtor, kind of like a portal form. Oh, all realtors can look at right. that. Yeah, whatever realtor right. will, whatever realtor will ask to participate in the research, they've all got access to RAINS to the to the national database. That, that I mean, accessing RAINS is not a huge issue. The properties that you'll find on there are usually published on the multi listing websites as well. Um, what what it does give the realtors is the ability to know if that agent is willing to share his commission with other agent with a buyer side agent. If it's not on RAINS, then maybe they won't. Then it takes some more convincing. But it's basically the same database of properties. Actually, the MLS websites have more properties than RAINS because the ones on RAINS are only the ones where the agents are okay dealing with the buyer's agent and, and sharing their commission. Okay. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah, so with that... If, if you can help with uh, find, look for other listing, I think it's definitely, you know, worth to, um, you know, partner with you to find my home. Yep. I'm, I'm, I'm not really concerned about time. Okay, I, that, that's my good. Main goal is, okay. My main goal is to able to find a place within a year. Yep. That should be, I think, more than doable. Yeah. Is there any chance that within that year your budget might grow a little bit, or is that going to be it? Um. Yes. the The budget will grow. Okay. A bit, I won't say a lot. Even one million yen is already a big jump forward at this level of property. I think so. Okay. Um, my 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 main budget is coming from my sister and. Okay. And uh, that that's exactly what she said that, you know, you give me more time, I can I can get you a little more. So. It's a good sister you got there. Okay, so what we want to do, <laughs> so, okay, so I think because we're, these are all old vacant homes, so they should also be at least slightly negotiable, sometimes very negotiable. So maybe we can base the search on say 8 million yen and bear in mind that we're going to try to either bring it down to six or if it's towards the end of the year maybe it'll be around seven ish and would that be okay if we if we limit it to six and seven plus those potential 20 percent purchase costs is that gonna probably fit within your budget you think yeah absolutely um I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just very conservative with the, with the number, what I can afford, because I know that I'll have to give myself probably three to four months, four months max of um, paying dual um, fees as in one for my current rental home and then one starting paying off the loan, right? So that I, I give myself maybe four months of budget to do that, plus on top of all the administrative fees and for your service those are all the money I'm, I'm tying into also like for moving costs uh for buying new fridge 
washer dryers, all those causes in my mind. So I'm just very conservative with my my number. I mean, to be very honest with you, my my by the number, my budget is at a hundred thirty thousand uh, U.S. dollars. But you're counting renovations so saying, and repairs and stuff like that, right? Of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. If, you know, for for the for the property closing costs. Like you said, around 60 to 80, I think is doable. Okay. Okay. So that, that definitely gives us something to work with, I think. So the, again, we can do the research on an hourly basis if you want. So we can just charge you for a 10 hour uh, retainer bank, and then we'll draw for that whenever we research or communicate with agents and so forth. And that's going to be uh, 44,000 yen. So 4,000 yen per hour plus tax. Um, and then... Okay. Towards the end of those 10 hours, we can see where we're at. And if you've got something that you want to move forward on, then we can just switch to full facilitation and we can, then there's not going to be any hourly limit. We'll just represent you until it's done. Let's say, um, I'm just calculating. Yep. Maybe for the, for the 5% fee, maybe it's, yep. it's actually more, um, economical like you said if like we dig into if i see that we're you know conducting due diligence on five six seven properties i'd probably stop you and say that's probably time to switch over <laughs> but if we're just going to uh -huh. be doing the initial research just to bring out some potentials and see if there's anything to move forward on i think the initial 10 hours will be more than enough okay mm. uh that's that's very nice of you that I, I, we just we aim to please some people uh, need more some people need less. if you got a Japanese partner who's going to be a part of the facilitation maybe you don't even need us for that we'll see how we go maybe we'll just take another 10 hour bank just to support you along the way while she's signing documents and we can review the documents for her and stuff like that in that case you... I don't think that's possible <laughs> no okay because you and I remember you said something in the podcast about um, your Japanese spouse you know the culture is not timid, but if they never done it before, they will never be kind of like gaijin to be adventurous to do things. So that's exactly her. I, so I don't, I don't believe that she can be of any more help other okay. than calling the realtor up, looking for places, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we'll leave her out of that and we'll, um, we'll start with the research and we'll see what we find and then we can take it from there. Sounds good. Awesome. Oh, great speaking to you. Um, so if you send me a name and address to put on the invoice, I'll send that your way and we can get started. Okay, I'll do that. Fantastic. I'll send it to your email. Yep, so, perfect. So um, all three of you guys can get, will get the info. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. Yes, very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You as well. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, if that's still a thing, or if you just need somewhere quiet to get away from the world. They offer a variety of options for families, corporate relocations, or even if you're simply transitioning between homes in Tokyo. The properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They come with fast unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in. Fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy. Fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but longer term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly in a Japanese business hotel. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, etc., you definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profit 
or a holiday home that you want to rent out when you're not using it via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth a visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at sales at realestate.jp. And now back to the podcast. So there you have a nice thorough conversation about the things to look at when buying an older, cheaper wooden home for your family here in Japan as U.S. military personnel with a Japanese spouse. A bit different to our next conversation. Apologies in advance, his side of the conversation is a bit low on volume, but it's a great chat that covers a lot of topics that should hold interest for many of you, so including that one as well. This guy is also US military, stationed near Yokosuka, just south of Yokohama in Tokyo. He has family here in Japan, but not a huge amount of savings, so he's wondering how he could potentially secure a loan. Maybe he could somehow um, use his resident family members and if not, what could his budget buy in cash in the area between Yokohama, where his family lives, and Yokosuka, where he works? Now, in Yokosuka, generally speaking, is it a good place to invest? Which properties would be most suitable and provide the highest yields? And we talk about listing to uh, military personnel who pay higher rents than Japanese tenants. Mm -hmm. We also talk about Okinawa's real estate market, the differences between investing in Japan and the USA, the logistics of remitting funds into and out of Japan without losing too much on exchange rates, um, older versus younger properties, and a bunch of other topics. I hope you found value in this conversation as well, and I'll see you again on the other side. Okay, so I've looked at the properties you've attached and I looked at the um, the allowance that you provided the allowance information for rent and utilities that you provided but before we dig into any of that deeper how are you I saw your email about the loan how are you you don't have a Japanese spouse do you uh, no, I do not. okay so uh, I'm I'm really not aware of any lender that will lend to you on a SOFA visa without a Japanese spouse who's at least part-time employed. So if you've got a Japanese spouse who's co-signatory to the loan, then they will consider your earning capacity as repayment uh, capacity. So th that's okay, but she has to be at least, she or he have to be at least working part-time to be considered as co-signatory and you don't have a spouse so the, the SOFA, from the bank's perspective, the SOFA visa is not any kind of a permanent visa. They know that you can be relocated or repositioned or, or at any time. So as far as I'm aware, there's no lender in Japan who will consider you as a sole signatory on a loan with that visa. So I'm wondering if that if that still makes your plan valid or, or are you only relying on financing? Uh, yeah, first off, uh, Mr. Jim, um yeah, so I'm going to be moving out to Japan, um, and I'm thinking of this more so as a long-term uh, plan. Yep. Um, in, in Japan, I, I go by Taichi. Uh, that's my uh, my name out there. But I'm uh, moving out there uh, in February, and uh, I'm pretty much going to be a liaison for U.S. and Japan. And uh, I used to have a dual citizenship for both U.S. and Japan citizenship, and I have family in Yokohama, which is about an hour away from Yokosuka. Okay. So... So there's a, a good chance that I'll be out there for the next five, six years uh, with my language uh, capability out there. So uh, something to uh, take into consideration is that um, I'm not just a, a SOFA member. Um, that's 100% Americans per se, but um, you know I have my family out there and uh, some past uh, um, history of living in Japan as well. Yeah, I, I get that, but... I don't know that your family, I mean, if, if someone from your family is going to be signing the papers and taking out the loan and then you have an arrangement with them to pay them back, that's one thing. The bank, the lender is not going to be involved in that. But to accept you as an applicant, um, I'm not sure if family relations that are not spouse relationships qualify. I just have no idea about that. But... I'm, I'm thinking they might not be very open to that. I could be completely wrong, but I think they, as far as I'm aware, they're not going to consider that 
um, as they do a spouse relationship. I see. So, Mr. Zip, I'm hearing the afternoon Japanese wife. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. I wouldn't do that for a loan, but yeah, that would definitely make it make things easier. Yeah, and also bear in mind that the spouse needs to be co-signatory. So. If you just meet someone and get married in a in a six months time, I doubt uh, he or she will want to sign anything like that. <laughs> yeah, understood. Mm. But um, is, uh, how long have you been in Japan? Uh, Eleven years now. Okay. I've been coming and going for about ten years before that, but living here permanently for about eleven years. Where are you from originally? Israel, but I lived in Australia, so I'm, I'm also dual citizen, uh, Israeli, Australian. I lived in Australia for about 10 years when I left Israel, and then I came here about 11 years ago. Oh, I see. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Uh, during, my, during my semester abroad in Japan, I was able to meet uh, many uh, personnel from Australia. So uh, it seems like you know a lot of people from Australia uh, come to Japan and, uh, and uh, opposite as well. Yeah, definitely. A lot of our customers are from Australia. It's a it's a thing for Australian. It's it's close, and they love the place. So yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, so yeah, going back to the discussion with the uh, the sofa, I was actually you know li listened to some of the other podcasts that you had uh, mentioned and recommended to listen. And uh, have you had any success with any of the, your uh, your clients or uh, listeners? Uh, mortgage wise no none of them none of them applied or qualified for a mortgage and the ones that I spoke to that you've listened to in the episodes um, I think they just wanted some general advice and then they were going to proceed on their own so I haven't heard back from them but I'm assuming at least one or two of them would have gone ahead with a purchase but they were all cash buyers as far as I'm aware oh I see okay mm. understood so they weren't really the ones that I've spoken to were not in a position to have, to get a loan since they didn't have a Japanese spouse, so no. Okay, you yeah. understood. Got it. Uh, so uh, I think maybe, I mean, obviously the condo units are more attractive in the sense that, you know, there's no structural maintenance that you need to worry about except for the monthly building fees. But um, I think the chances of you being able to afford a maybe an older family home kind of wooden uh, family home structure they'd be older but they would be a lot cheaper i think so you could potentially buy something like that for let's say 100 or 150,000 if you've got that much in cash and then you maybe wouldn't need a loan but if you're going for those condo units that satisfy the housing office requirements they would be more expensive yeah also the ones that you forwarded to me were built in 1985 and 1987 so they're getting close to 40 years of age which is when building fees can rise more significantly it's not a huge concern when you've got a uh, military tenant because they pay a lot obviously but if and when for some reason you'll have to rent this out to normal japanese tenants um, you might find that um, building fees are getting a bit too high for for any significant yield right so if they're only paying um, I don't know a thousand bucks and not the two thousand bucks that the uh, military personnel will pay then if building fees are three four hundred bucks that's already eating into a significant chunk of your earnings right right mm -hmm. and uh, yeah and as far as I go uh, I was thinking do you have any uh, investments out in Yokosuka area the reason why I was interested in uh, Yokosuka and in between Yokohama is I was talking to the, uh, the head manager at uh, Yokosuka housing office over, over there and we were talking about the housing requirements and everything like that, and she was saying that there's not so many houses in between Yokosuka and uh, Yokohama. This includes Kanata Hake, Kanata Bunko, Kamioka, as well as uh, even Obama, which is a little bit, uh, which is a train station north of Shiri. Yep. Uh, yep. But that area makes it very attractive for uh, members like myself uh, who want to go to Yokohama often or frequent uh, Tokyo. Did they say that there are not many houses or not many properties, including condos? Uh, yeah, not many properties, including okay. condos. Okay. Uh, it's, it's harder to come by uh, than, a, say, an apartment or a condo uh, near your coast area. Um, well, it's hard to come by the ones that would qualify for the housing office requirements. If you're looking for like a studio or a one-bedroom unit in an older building, there's plenty of those. But those don't qualify, right. I think, for personnel now. 
Yeah, so I mean, do you have a cash budget? Let's assume that you can't get a loan. How much would you be able to pay in cash? Uh, cur yeah, currently at this time, uh, I definitely don't have a hundred thousand uh, in the in the bank at this time. Yeah, uh, because I I own two homes here in the states, uh, and you know, right now they're uh, netting about five, uh, four to five hundred per house, uh, and. Uh, you know, obviously homes in uh, the States could uh, appreciate or depreciate value. But, um, you know, the main purpose of this call was I was trying to figure out, uh, since I'm going to be in Japan long term, you know, wh what are the bigger benefits from you know, investing in a home in Japan uh, by s somewhere like in the States? Um, well, first off, to separate the, the military conversation. So I wouldn't, if you're not going to be... Um, able to purchase or, or you know qualify for a loan and you're not going to be renting out to military personnel so let's say let's say your cash budget is 50 or 60 thousand us then you could buy one of those older studios and just rent it out to a normal japanese tenant but in those cases i probably wouldn't go for yokosuka um yokohama maybe if it's not super suburban so more central or at least close to center let's say 15 to 20 30 minutes from Yokohama station would be a probably a good location where you could easily get tenants if and when it's vacant but beyond that Yokosuka is decreasing in population and suburban Yokohama is very suburban I mean it's a big city but anywhere beyond the main f let's call it four or five main train stations is very very suburban and um, so it could be more challenging to get tenants in those spots if and when the unit becomes vacant so if you did have Again, fifty, sixty thousand in cash. Um, there would be other locations that I'd probably refer you to that would make better investments, um, unless we happen to find something in more central Yokohama. And then the advantages, um, I guess, compared to what you used to from the U.S., the tenants are very docile. There's no forced evictions, squatters, um, you know, people running drug labs or, or just not paying rent and refusing to move out. That usually doesn't happen in Japan. On the rare few occasions that we have had tenants with payment issues, we just send them a letter and ask them to leave and they leave. So th there's none of the conflict that you might be used to with, with bad tenants in the US. A bad tenant in Japan just means low income earner. They might occasionally be slightly late or, or miss a payment, but it's very rare here. They're just just hardworking people in, in you know poor neighborhoods, but there's no ghettos and such in Japan, right? And then the, um, the other advantages are that, A, they're quite affordable. So in your case, maybe all you can afford is one property. But if somebody has a budget of, say, two, three hundred thousand dollars, they could divide that into three or four properties, which is more difficult to do in other countries. So that obviously gives you more diversity. You've got four or five income streams as opposed to just one. So if and when a tenant moves out, your portfolio is still making money and you can spread it out more geographically, socioeconomically. So just the power of affordability and diversity is, is another factor. And the third factor is that similar to Japanese tenants, the companies that you're going to be working with, the um, insurance company, the, the homeowner association, the uh, property management company, they're all very Japanese and by the book. No one's got their hand in your pocket and trying to hit you with fees if they can get away with it. No one, I mean, they, they tend to be responsive when there's an issue, maybe not super proactive. They're still, you know, a bit scared to make decisions on their own because they are, again, the Japanese psyche kind of, um, that they, they will wait for you to tell them what to do, but they're very honest and, and professional. Everyone's, everything's got a paper trail a mile long. So... I guess the, the, the lack of headaches in management here is, is also a big attractive factor for people. I see. I see. Uh, typically, like a property management fee in the States would cost 9 to 10% um, around there. But in Japan, uh, I've heard that it's also very uh, a little bit lower. It's 5% plus tax, usually, unless there's um, some you know particular city where there aren't many property managers. But usually it's about 5% plus tax, maybe 4% plus tax, depending on the, on the property management company. But they do also charge you a placement fee when they put a new tenant in place. So in those cases, once a property becomes vacant, they're not going to charge you monthly. But then when they place a new tenant, they'll charge you one month as a minimum. 
And if it's a particularly hard of, uh, time of year or for any reason there's more supply than demand and they'll need to you know, take some extra steps to find the tenant more quickly, then it might cost you two or three months. So they might offer a one month free for the first tenant that applies. They might share the listing with other property managers and then they give them a commission of one month as well. So there might be different strategies they'll need to do, which might bring the placement fee up to two or three months, but the average is usually one or two months. Oh, I see. Understood. Mm. And uh, I remember I sent you the uh, the properties in Kanazo Bunko and uh, Kanazo Hake. Yep. And um, the cheaper the two, um, the uh, the one in Kanazo Bunko, for example, uh, in U.S. dollars that would go for uh, two hundred eighty thousand dollars. And I was looking at the um, uh, the rates for the loan uh, out there uh, with the uh, member that I was talking to, and for a thirty year fixed rate. For example, it's a zero point six six percent interest rate. Um, That's for home ownership. That's a home loan. If you're buying something that you're going to be renting out, the rates are going to be different, and the terms are going to be a bit different. I see. So, so it's I'm more like uh, two two and a half percent interest for investment loans, and I think they'll want you to put twenty percent down. Whereas with home loans, um, they'll give you a hundred or a hundred and five percent. They'll cover including costs. I see. Now, if you were to live in the home uh, initially, would you have to change that loan over from a... Only if they find out. <laughs> Only if they find okay. out. Yeah. So as okay. long as, I mean, technically, as long as there's somebody who can still collect the post, like if they send you a letter, for example, and that bounces back because, um, you know, you're not living there and nobody picked it up or the tenant returned it to the post, post office saying it's not mine, then they will find out, right? Right. Yeah. And then it's up to the lender. So some of them will ask to change you over to an investment loan. Some of them will just say, no, you have to pay it all off right now. Please sell the property and pay off the loan. I mean, depending on the lender, they each have their own policies on that. I see. Yeah, I'm starting to kind of understand why uh, cash is probably the, uh, cash is one of the best ways to uh, kind of invest in a property like this. Um, I mean, look, if you're a resident, then, you know, a loan is definitely an option and the interest rates are low enough to make it attractive even for an investment loan. But without residency, it's going to be quite challenging. And even if you do have residency, they'll want to see that you're being uh, that you've got a stable income history of, say, two to three years. That's um, from a Japanese entity. And again, I don't think the U.S. military would qualify for them. Um, so even if you're a resident, you'll need to be employed in some other capacity except by a foreign company or a foreign organization like the military, like, like the U.S. military. I see. Now, Zivsan, um, have, you, have you been able to qualify for loans yourself uh, being in Japan and establishing yourself out there? Yeah, but I, I do have a Japanese spouse. We also have a Japanese business that's been generating income for 10, 11 years. So for us, it's not really an issue. And we haven't we haven't taken out any loans yet because my partner and I are both not really um, super keen on, on loans. We like to buy what we have in cash. So we've been growing our portfolio more slowly. Um, but now that we're a lot more comfortable with the process of, of managing properties in Japan after this decade or so, then we are considering to uh, buy the next one with a loan. Yes. So I haven't applied yet, but I can't see why we wouldn't qualify, I think. Okay. That makes sense. I remember earlier uh, we had talked a little bit about you know, buying it through, say, like a family member. Uh, have you ever had or seen anything um, like that before? Where, say, you know, I buy it? I buy no, it I mean, people house. People have asked me about it. I've given them a bit of advice on it, but they haven't gotten back to me to say that they went ahead and did it, so I'm not sure. But, I mean, I guess it depends on the relationship you have with your family, right? Like, how, how close are you? Would they consider it? Right. Yeah, that, Yeah, you're definitely right about that. Mm. Makes sense. And the, in an earlier podcast, I heard you talk a little bit about, you know, don't rely on capital growth in Japan. Correct. Um, you know, whereas in the States or another country, you may be able to rely on capital growth uh, for homes. Um, um, to a point. I mean, you've got your cycles too in the U.S. I've seen uh, property prices drop after a crisis. So as long as you're in it for the long haul, I think, yes, it's a good market to, to bank on as far as capital growth goes. But if for some reason you have to sell the property let's say in five, six years time and, you know, a crisis happens, you could be in the same boat, right? Right. And uh, th by that, did you mean that the uh, generally the home prices in Japan, will they drop over time? Um, big 
cities and big metropolitan centers definitely tend to hold their value. They don't drop that much, um, aside from the post-90s bubble uh, crash that happened here. And Tokyo and Osaka specifically, Fukuoka as well, have definitely been rising since 2012. Even, even during crisis, even during COVID or whatnot, property prices were still growing in those three cities. There are other locations um, like Niseko up in Hokkaido where, you know, it's multi-million dollar mansion homes for international um, winter holiday makers. Those kinds of places also tend to grow. But the rest of the country has been pretty stagnant since the 90s. So some smaller towns have grown very little. Some have not grown at all. And the ones that are emptying of population um, out in the countryside definitely are practically worthless at this point, right? Okinawa, we're not super experienced with. I know that the um, in Naha City and the areas that are close to the U.S. bases tend to be expensive, but the rest of the islands seem to be very reasonably priced, similar to other small towns in in, uh, in Japan. But I'm not sure if the smaller islands and the uh, more rural locations in Okinawa will get you uh, too many tenants. It might be a, a bit of a challenge to get tenants in there when one moves out. Oh, I see. Have you ever been to Okinawa before? Yep. Yep, we like um, Yakojima is usually our favorite island. Oh, I see. Yeah, I never got the chance to go to uh, Miyako. Uh, but it's a very different atmosphere. It's lovely for a holiday. I don't know if it's huge for um, business and investment and so forth. I guess if you buy um, like um, short-term stay apartments, like those hotel resort types, villas and that that kind of thing, you probably would be able to make some good money on it. But then short-term stays requires a lot more hands-on involvement. It's not as passive as a, a long-term lease tenant, right? Right, that makes sense. You need to constantly uh, be aware of how many bookings you've got. You need to handle check-ins, check-outs, guest requests, and, and, and issues that they have. You want to keep an eye on your profitability because it can be very seasonal. You could suddenly see that you're not getting tenants. You need to improve something. So it becomes a bit of a job, maybe not full time, but definitely a job. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. And uh, pretty close to uh, one of the major bases out there, you got you know American Village. And I believe that area might be uh, somewhat uh, attractive for, say, an investor. It is, yeah, but I've looked at some properties there. They, they're cheaper than, you know, Tokyo and, and uh, Osaka, but then I didn't feel that they were much cheaper than Yokohama or, or Yokosuka, for that matter. Um, yeah, before, a couple months ago, I didn't know whether I was going to, uh, say, Okinawa or Yokosuka area. So um, I think I'm going to focus a little bit more towards, uh, you know, the main, mainland, mainland Japan now, now yep. that I'm uh, going there instead. Well, you've got um, family in Yokohama too. It makes sense, right? Yes, I, yeah. I do. Yeah, my uh, my grandparents are getting a little bit old, so it's going to be nice just to be able to spend time with them. And, um, oh, if it's your them. grandparents, by the way, I don't think they'll qualify for a loan anyway. You need to be, um, I think, up to eighty or seventy something by the time the loan matures. So I'm not sure if they'll qualify for anything longer than maybe five, six years. I'm not sure how old they are. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, um, I also got aunt and uncle. They probably qualify. Okay, that, that. that's probably better, yeah. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah Tim, going back to, the, uh, going back to the, the capital growth, what you were talking about, and highest yield, um, I remember the two, so the two properties that I sent you were 75 square meters, yep. uh, equivalent to about uh, 800 square feet for uh, American listeners. Um, but you, you talked a little bit about how um, a lot of investors, you know, chose properties that were 25 to 50 square meters uh, just to try to get a higher yield. Uh, More like 15 to 25, yeah. Beyond 25, it becomes... Um, I, the, the bigger the property is, um, the lower the yield becomes because the price graph rises um, a lot more rapidly than the rental graph. So... Um, Let's say if you're buying a studio unit, it might cost um, double the price if you're buying uh, if you're buying a big family sized unit. But then the rental price is not going to be double; it's going to be maybe thirty percent extra. So, as those two graphs pull apart, as the prop price of the property rises and the size rises, then the yield tends to drop as well. 
And also in between tenants, you've got more to renovate, right? You've got two, three bedrooms. It's obviously a more costly renovation than a little studio. But there are advantages to those as well. I mean, family tenants tend to be more stable. They stay longer. They take better care of the apartment than some dirty old g son who always smokes in there and never opens the windows, right? So there's advantages and disadvantages to both. But, you know, all things being equal, yes, the yield tends to be lower for bigger properties, as well as for newer properties. If they're younger than 20 years, they also tend to uh, be a lot pricier and, and don't really generate that much more rent. Makes sense. That makes sense. I know we're 15 to 25 uh, square meter with the highest yield. That makes sense. But you know, we go back to the base criteria. Um, it has to be greater than 50 square meters. For uh, military personnel, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, as from a renter's perspective, especially coming from somewhere somewhere like the states, uh, you know, I want I want somewhere that's you know two or three bedroom. Uh, you know, if I were to move to uh, Japan, so. As from a buyer investor perspective, that's something that I'll keep in account too. Yeah. Uh, to try to um, have an attractive property for, um, say, like a Gaiji member. Yep, understood. So that I mean, definitely, if you're planning to rent out to Gaijins, bigger is the way to go. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So finding that fine balance between 50 square meter to possibly uh, 75 square meter, I think that's my um, that's my target. Yeah, but we'll need to uh, sort out your um, your budget first because assuming you're not going to get a loan, you said you don't have that much, right? So there might not be 280,000 US, but they're not going to be less than 150, 160, I would assume. That's correct. I, I'd say my budget is around the 50 at the moment. Yeah, so that, that doesn't buy you more than a studio unit, unfortunately, or maybe a two-bedroom if it's a bit older and more suburban. But um, not 50 square, I think 30, 35 at best. And even then, it's going to be a pretty old remote property, right? So 50, 60 will usually buy you, if we're talking about those areas, it'll buy you a studio unit in not super central Yokohama, um, maybe Chiba City, less likely, but maybe Saitama City. Um, and beyond that, you're looking at other smaller towns that are further away. Okay. Yeah. Or it could be a smaller town in a completely different uh, area of Japan. It could be a prefectural capital or a bedroom community. Like Kobe, for example, sometimes has these kinds of properties, which is a very good city to buy in. Um, suburban Fukuoka, Nagoya, uh, Sapporo, those kinds of places. They're not Tokyo or Osaka, but they definitely um, have the tenant base to support any kind of investment. rates that I sent you, I'm starting to kind of realize why uh, Japanese members that rent out to military uh, profit so much. Yep. You know, just just as a case study, um, for a 01 or 02, uh, or excuse me, 03 OHA, that's 1627 for the 23, yep. 2023 rate. Um, and for example, the, uh, the Kanazawa Hake house that I sent you would be approximately about $900 in uh, mortgage per month with that low interest rate so you're netting about seven eight hundred dollars a month yep yeah it's a it's a good deal if you can get it um it's even a good deal if you buy an older wooden home which again might be a lot cheaper but with those homes you have to consider that they could be not worthless but they could be worth less in value than when you bought it so you really want to maximize the income with the houses a lot more than the condo units because the condo units will still be you know at least semi profitable once you've got a no normal japanese tenant in there but the houses might not be once you factor in the maintenance and the structural work that needs to be done every few years which you don't have with a condo unit right I 
think that might be a bit optimistic. I'd probably aim more for 900 to 1,000 if you're looking at these um, types of properties. I mean, it'd be great if you get 12, 13, but let's not count on that. And then um, the other thing is that then you have to really seriously look at the at the maintenance co at the uh, building fees, right? Because if you look at, I'm just looking at the one that you sent. That's I think AC uh, uh, sixty. So so that sixty is nineteen eighty five. So nineteen eighty five units. Um, you're paying Niman. What's that? Niman Nisen. Almost Niman Sanzen. In monthly building fees, right? I've got ten nine hundred and then twelve eighty five, uh, twelve eight five eight below that. So, if you're making nine hundred bucks, but you're paying I don't know two hundred bucks in building fees, um, plus insurance, plus occasional maintenance. I mean, it's still it's still a reasonable deal, but it's not as attractive. Like if you were going again for a normal Japanese tenants, I'd go for a studio or one bedroom, not for that. But if you think now, if you've been following this podcast for a while, and in particular our JREP sessions, you're probably more than familiar with Blanca Kobayashi of Arc Reform. They're a bilingual renovation company serving clients in the Kanagawa and Kanto area. So Tokyo, Chiba, Saitama, Kawasaki, Yokohama. They can handle simple, small scale projects as well as full house renovations, and they will work with you on the perfect design for your dream family home. But not only homes, Arc Reform also handle commercial property renovations, offices, restaurants, bars, shops, you name it, from traditional classics to the latest trends in interior design and renovations. So you want to email them for a free consultation and quote at info at arcreform.com. That's A-R-K reform, all one word, dot com, and give your home or commercial space the love and care that it deserves. But if you think that you can maximize profits and maybe, you know, rent it out to military personnel for the next 10 years, then it's definitely worth it, yeah. Absolutely. What you, one of the other discussions uh, from uh, the real estate agents out near Yokosuka was that the apartments and condos near Yokosuka, Chiro, and Shoyedi is a little bit more older, whereas the more north or further you get from Yokosuka, you have a little bit more newer properties yep. uh, built in the 80s and 90s. I'd always go for newer if you can, because again, once they hit 30 years and the ones you've sent are closer to 40, um, the building fees tend to rise a lot more rapidly because it does require a lot more annual maintenance. So as long as you can postpone that by buying a newer property, if you can afford it, that's probably a better deal. It'll be a bit lower on the yield because the property will be a bit more expensive, but it'll give you 10 years of peace of mind before the building fees start racking up, right? I see. That makes sense. Now, have you seen uh, properties uh, in the uh, post 2000s around the Yokohama, uh, Yokosuka area? And would you recommend those? Post 2000, as in 20 years-ish and younger. 20 years, yeah, 20 years or younger. Um, yes, we have. Again, they're not super high yield compared to the older ones, but they definitely do exist. I think we've been fortunate to get some deals that were, say, 2010, I think, was the youngest that still made sense financially. Um, and obviously, you know, as the years go on, we'll probably be... Um, you know, calendar wise, it'll be younger, but usually 20 to 30 years is the sweet spot for yield normally. Okay. Got it. Understood. But we do, we do get lucky sometimes, especially, um, this is not, again, not the type of budget that you're considering, but especially if you're talking about, um, a pato, like small buildings that are maybe, let's say two, three floors, um, up to eight, 10 units. Those we definitely can get 20 years and younger. Uh, condo units in concrete blocks, not as frequently. Oh, I see. Understand. Now, Ziv, uh, I'm thinking a little bit more, uh, you know, short term, mid term now. But you know, for me, moving to Yokosuka, pretty short term. I'm thinking about starting off as a, starting off renting, getting myself established there, getting an address there, and. Uh, Know, try to attend some of the meetings. For example, in February, I know that you guys have uh, a meetup. Yep, yep. Uh, so I'll stay in touch with you guys. Uh, and you know, my goal is to just try to get established there. You know, do well on the job, and then you know, more long term, perhaps I could try to uh, pick out a property out there when I'm up, when I'm there. 
Sure. Sounds like a plan. We're here to help. But um, let's get your financing or lack of financing sorted out first, then we'll know what budget we're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. And I did one more thing from uh, one of the other podcasts is I know you talked a little bit about OFX and TransferWise, the, uh, the currency exchange. Yep. Um, so, yeah, funny story here is that I remember going to Japan uh, frequently, uh, whether it was semester abroad or, you know, yearly visits to Obachano, Jichan and whatnot too. And I know the rate right now is pretty good for uh, the American because the uh, Japanese yen is a little bit weaker. Yep. Um, and I remember going to the ATM and, you know, exchanging, uh, you know, money out for my mom who was going to visit at a later time. Um, and, you know, had I known about OFX or TransferWise, that would have been very beneficial. Uh, but yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yep. Yeah, do you recommend one or the other? Uh, we've been with OFX personally for since we started, so about 11 years as well. Um, I find that their service is a lot more professional. With TransferWise, for example, if you book, it's a very large kind of autopilot corporation in the sense that if you booked a deal and you, you know, you booked the wrong amount by mistake, say it's very common for people to just add a zero, especially when they're trying to convert yens to dollars in their heads. So you might you might have booked a deal for a hundred thousand bucks instead of ten thousand bucks by mistake. If you then cancel the deal with TransferWise, there's no one to speak to. They'll charge you their fee for the transaction, and you'll just have to book another one, right? But with OFX, if we because we have an, I mean, us specifically, we're a corporate account, so we have a very dedicated account manager. But even if you are just as an individual, or if you go with us, then you have access to our corporate account, so we'll refer you, and they'll tag you under our account. And there's somebody to speak to, right? So I can send an email to our account manager, say, sorry, that was a mistake. They'll just, she'll just get out there and cancel it for me immediately. There's no fees or anything attached. There's just um, there's a service person to speak to. It's not um, faceless kind of electronic correspondence, which is what you'll get with the bigger ones like TransferWise. I see. So we've been very happy with them. We keep referring people to them and we obviously uh, get better rates as we reform more people as well. But also our customers who have been working with them have been very satisfied. So we recommend them. Uh, and when you, when you transfer that, say like US dollars to Japanese yen, you could transfer it to yourself, correct? So there doesn't have to be another person in Japan correct. to receive it? Okay. As long as you have an account, yeah. Oh, I see. So I need to make a Japanese... Um, you need to have a Japanese okay. bank account, yeah. And you need to... Okay. Because they're not a registered financial vehicle in Japan, so you'll need to register with your U.S. address. So they need to see that you're a U.S. resident with a U.S. address that you can prove via utility bill or some kind of document. And then you can sign up. But um, if you point out that you're no longer living in the U.S. and you're already in Japan, um, I don't think they'll be able to onboard you. So you want to do it while you're still residing in the U.S. Okay. Understood. Thank you for the advice. No problem. Did I send you the um, the partner referral link that we have with them? Uh, no. Not All right. Yet. I'll send. I'll reply to your last email with that link. If you sign up through that link, then you'll be tagged under our account, and you'll have access to our corporate account manager, which makes things a lot smoother. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I think our Zoom is running out. I can jump back in there if you want, but I'm on the free version, so I think we've only got a couple of minutes. Um, did you want me to log uh, out and back in? Do you have more questions? Uh, no, I, th I think that, you know, for this time, yeah, actually, you know, once this runs out, I'll try to go ahead and uh, I might talk to you offline if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Tiff, can you talk a little bit about, you know, about the uh, investments that you may have near Yoko, uh, Yoko, Yokosuka or if you recommend any areas near there? Um, we've got one or two customers, I think, with a unit in Yokosuka. Um, when they're good, they're good, same as anywhere in Japan. But when we did get a vacancy, we did have to wait a bit until we found a new tenant and we did have to reduce the rent. Um, and I'm guessing that's because at the moment there's more supply than demand there. Again, the population is decreasing in Yokosuka. It might have changed a bit after COVID. I'm not sure. But we're not going to have um, census numbers until 2025. So there might have been a bit of a trend of people moving out of Tokyo and into Yokosuka as, as, as they do into other cities around Tokyo. Because COVID has brought a little bit of that about. 
But as of the 2020 census, the population is in decrease and we're feeling that when we get a vacancy there. So I wouldn't, like if it wasn't for the military personnel option, I wouldn't highlight Yokosuka as a, as a favored area for investment. I see. Got it. Well, uh, Zipsan, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I was wondering, after this call, would you be able to, any chance that I could uh, call you um, or send you a different link to talk a little bit offline? Yeah, sure. I'll send you my. Uh, I'll send you my. Uh, uh, you got my mobile number on the uh, on the signature in the email. So just just call that number whenever you're ready. I'm. I've got another appointment at eleven, but I'm good until then. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Uh, actually, I can't do international call, but what I'll try to do is. Uh, oh, that's right. You're in the U.S. Sorry. Uh, well, my number works for WhatsApp, for Line, for FaceTime. You can use the same number for those. Okay. Or um, can I send you another Zoom link? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Go for it. Okay. Perfect. I'll see you in a few. Sounds good. See you soon. So there you have it. Two very different buyers with very different criteria, but both of them serving here in U.S. military bases, of which there are plenty in Japan. If the topic is of interest to you as well, we'll also link to previous conversations that we've had with U.S. military folks in the past. Feel free to listen to those too if you're in the same or similar spot to any of these good folks. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa-related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku. Yoroshiku.